system. I know it's um, oh, uh, St. Patrick's Day today, so I won't keep you too long. I'm kind of impressed that you've come. Um, if you've got any questions, then you can leave them for me at the end. And I've got some questions at the start that we can go through. They're just ones that you can quickly answer either in the chat or um, like in your head or write them down or whatever. Um, it's fine if you don't want to say it in the chat. Um, so we're going to be talking about the valvular heart disease, um, the, all the murmurs, acute coronary syndrome, atherosclerosis. Um, I had a look at all the learning objectives for year two and this is essentially what I found in those little boxes. Um, basically if you just go through them all, learn them well, then you'll be fine for your summatives. If you go with whatever they give to you in the lectures, then um, you're set to score well. And if you do some wider reading as well, that can always be good for any of the difficult questions that the med school put in there. Um, by the way, if you hear any like sounds, I think my street are having some St. Patrick's Day party. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, cool. Right, so some warm up questions. As I said, you can put them in the chat. I don't know, I can't actually see the chat function. Um, or you can just say it in your head. Right. Oh, right, <laughs> you might have seen that. Um, you're on the diabetic foot ward round and you're asked by the consultant to assess for the presence of the posterior tibial pulse. Whereabouts would you find this? I'll give you about 30 seconds. You want to put it in the chat or not? So it's behind and below the medial ankle. I've got a little photo there. Sorry, it's a foot. No one likes feet. <laughs> um, okay, next question. Right. A 68 year old man is about to undergo surgery for a transitional cell carcinoma of the left kidney. His left renal artery needs to be located and dissected as part of the operation. What vertebral level would the surgeon find the origin of this artery? So a bit of anatomy here. Is it T12, L1, L3 or L4? I'll give you about half a minute to answer this one. So the answer to this one is L1. If you can see on this diagram, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor here, but this is the renal artery. Um, does anyone know what the celiac um, trunk, the, uh, the branches from of the celiac trunk supply? Okay, so they supply four gut structures and the superior mesenteric artery, that supplies the mid gut structures. So anything from the papilla in the second part of the duodenum to the um, first two thirds of the transverse colon and then the inferior mesenteric artery is anything from the distal third of the transverse colon to the rectum bit of recap from um, gastro block. Um, how about, does anyone know the importance of um, L4? What happens there, that level? It's the bifurcation of the aorta where it splits off into the left and right common iliac arteries. Right, next question. Which part of the heart is most likely to be injured in an anterior penetrating chest trauma? Is it the right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium or the left ventricle? I think having a good idea of how the heart sits in the chest is important because it's not like in all the diagrams, it's tilted. But does anyone know I'll give you about half a minute for this one. I'm really sorry, I can't see the chat, so you might have got this all right. Um, yeah, it's the right ventricle. As you can see, that big space there. So if anyone stabs you, they'll probably stab you in the right ventricle. I think this is a really important thing to know. 
as a hint maybe for your test on Friday. <laughs> um, right, so what's the normal duration of a QRS complex? A bit of um, ECG, ECG recap. I'll give you half a minute for this one. Is it more than 0.1 seconds, more than 0.8, or less than 0.12, 0.8, or less than 1.5? If you know, like, if you know it in terms of the little squares, if one small square is 0.04, how might that help you in answering this question? If you know in terms of the little, little squares. So less than 0.12 seconds. So 0.04 times by three, because you want it to be less than three small squares. Okay, right. A four-year-old boy with a history of unrepaired TRF has, is presenting to the emergency department with an acute history of cyanosis and respiratory distress. What are the four typical structural abnormalities of TRF? I'll let you read these ones out. This is a case of just, if you know it, and you'll get it right. If you don't, you need to go back and do some revision. Oh, I can see the chat now. Yeah, nice. Okay, I'll give you maybe 10 more seconds. Yeah, so it's A. And I think having like an, an, an image in your brain is really helpful for these kind of questions because you can kind of remember what the structural abnormalities are. I'm quite a visual learner, so with all these congenital heart diseases, I would sort of picture the image in my brain and then be able to answer the questions. Um, okay, so... A 42-year-old white man is found to have hypertension following a health checkup at his GP surgery. What's the first line antihypertensive in white males under 55? Is it A, beta blockers, B, diuretic, C, calcium channel blockers, D, an ACE inhibitor, or E, aspirin? People put, okay. About... 30 seconds for this one, guys. So I think someone said D there. That was good. That's the right answer. Can anyone give me an example of an ACE inhibitor? Or like what they end in? Ramipril. Yeah, that's really good. And can anyone tell me the mechanism of action of ACE inhibitors? or at least like what system that involves, that's really drilled into you, involves renin. Right, someone said stops renin. Okay, um, let me just get off this chat so I can actually see. So the RAS system, I'll run through this and how Ramapril sort of is involved with um, blocking the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 as opposed to stopping running. But I can see where you're coming from. So the RAS system, this is really, really important. And I advise you to just learn this off by heart, essentially, because it will help you in the future. So the liver produces or um, makes angiotensinogen, and then you get a renin from the macular cells in the kidney that converts that into angiotensin 1 and then you get ACE which is an enzyme that's from the lungs converts that into angiotensin 2. Now angiotensin 2 is a really potent vasoconstrictor so if you block the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 if you block that then you get vasodilatation and that's why it helps with high blood pressure because it lowers the blood pressure. Does everyone understand that bit? It's relatively straightforward if you know the RAS system well. And it's important to note here that it's the juxtaglomerular apparatus that is, the juxtaglomerular cells, sorry, 
um, and the macular cells what their role are because some people think it's the the juxtaglomerular of the cells that secrete renin some people it's the, uh, think it's the macular cells that secrete renin so if you learn it in that much detail then you can't go wrong with any questions on the RAS system because um, I think I got tested on this in year two in the uh, summative exams cool next one right so can anyone tell me what valve that is pointing to on the left it's the more heart anatomy okay that is the aortic valve and can anyone sh tell me what it might be indicating given the arrow back up to the aorta Oh, someone said. Okay, yeah, that's really good, yeah. And given the direction of blood flow um, illustrated by the arrow, what is that showing you? I'm talking about the diagram on the left, by the way. Yes, yeah, well done. So it's showing you aortic stenosis and I think um, regurgitation, that was the one for the, the, one, the image on the right. Um, in terms of these sort of heart sounds, these murmurs, I'm going to go on to that now. So it's helpful to have a diagram there as well, as I said, so you can actually visualise it and it's not just a bunch of words coming at you. So aortic stenosis, right, the most common murmur. And does anyone know what the causes of aortic stenosis are? Maybe two is what's good to have to in mind. So it involves a um, idiopathic age-related calcification and the other one, does anyone know? Oh. Rheumatic, yeah, rheumatic, um, let me get it up, rheumatic heart disease, yeah, well done. Um, and this causes left ventricular hypertrophy. So I'm going to run through the notes. Hopefully you can understand this. Basically, um, over time, you get wear and tear of the, of the moving valve, um, which is why it's related to um, age. And this then wears and tears the valve endothelium and the underlying matrix. And then as a result of this, you get a lot of fibrosis and calcification of the aortic valve. And then that means that it becomes narrow, impeding the blood supply through that aortic valve. Why is that bad? That's bad because the left ventricle has to then contract really, really hard to pump blood across this narrow valve. Um, you get a high left ventricular aortic um, pressure gradient initially, which is what tries to maintain the cardiac output. But over time, because it's contracting so forcefully, the left ventricle um, hypertrophy, so it's get, it gets bigger so that it can carry on pumping blood to the rest of the body. Um, and as a result, this, you get loads of other complications like um, dilatation of the left atrium, Oh, sorry, uh, hypertrophy of the left atrium. Um, and then you get stiff left ventricle um, and that can lead to other complications like um, dyspnea and angina on exertion, which we know as um, um, an acute coronary syndrome on stable angina. Um, does anyone know what kind of murmur you get with aortic stenosis? Yes, crescendo, decrescendo, yes, that's really good. Um, so with an aortic stenosis, you get ejection systolic, um, um, well, there we go, crescendo, decrescendo murmur, um, and that can radiate to the carotids. With murmurs, I'd say just learn which, um, that which murmur would correspond to the valvular heart disease, because it's so easily, um, examined like in a, an SBA format 
definitely learn the murmurs. <laughs> okay, so next one is aortic regurgitation. What is the main cause of aortic regurgitation? So with aortic regurgitation, the main cause is idiopathic age-related weakness and that causes left ventricular dilatation as opposed to in aortic stenosis you get left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, so can anyone tell me some examples of like kinetic uh, tissue diseases that can lead to aortic regurgitation? Yeah, Marfan syndrome. Yes, that's good. So um, with aortic regurgitation, you get blood. So if you look at that image again, you, you get blood flowing back from the aorta into the left ventricle. Um, as a result of this, you get turbulent flow. So blood isn't flowing in one direction. It's flowing all over the place. You get turbulent blood flow through that valve. Um, during diastole and you can hear that when you're auscultating and as a result of the backflow you get reduced pressure gradient across um, the aorta and the left ventricle and that means that the, um, the murmur sort of reduces during diastole which is why you get a decrescendo murmur as opposed to a crescendo decrescendo murmur we saw with aortic stenosis. There we go. Does anyone know um, what the complications are of aortic regurgitation that involves the heart? You get heart failure. Um, and why is this? It's because of the back uh, pressure of blood that's waiting to get through um, the left side of the heart. Um, so with aortic regurgitation there's two sort of stages to it, um, acute and chronic. So in the acute phase you get um, compensation, so stretching of the left ventricular myocytes in order to increase stroke volume, but chronically you get dilatation of the left ventricle and that then hypertrophies in order to accommodate for the raised and diastolic volume. And then a result, as a result of that, you get heart failure. Um, because at the start, you need, the heart is trying to increase the stroke volume to sort of maintain a normal cardiac output. But then eventually the heart can't meet the demands of the body and you get reduced forward flow and then heart failure. Are there any questions so far? That's quite a lot of information thrown at you. No, okay. Right, we'll move on to the other valves now. <laughs> Can anyone tell me what valve this is? I'll go through this one quickly. No one likes valvular heart disease. So that's mitral stenosis, narrowing of the mitral valve and Oh, someone said something. Mitral valve, yeah. Um, and then that's mitral regurgitation, shown by the arrow, which is um, blood flow. Right, let's go through mitral stenosis. So does anyone know what causes mitral stenosis? Or, yeah, well, it's kind of similar to the other one. So with mitral stenosis, it's caused by rheumatic heart disease or infective endocarditis. Um, oh, someone said something. Mitral heart disease. What? Yeah, no, it's, sorry. It's um, rheumatic heart disease for mitral stenosis. And with mitral stenosis, you get a narrow valve, which is making it difficult for the left atrium to push blood through to the left ventricle. And does anyone know the murmur you get with mitral stenosis? Again, it's one to learn, just learn it off by heart, the murmurs. Oh, 
so late consistent murmur so with mitral stenosis you get a mid diastolic low pitched rumbling murmur so essentially with mitral stenosis you get a thickened and stiff leaflet which um, means that blood flow is obstructed from going to the left atrium to the left ventricle um, that then increases pressure across that mitral valve and when you've got that you get turbulent blood flow as we said that's not blood flow in one direction you get turbulent blood flow across that valve in ventricular diastole and as a, as a result you get mid diastolic rumble um, does anyone know what it causes in terms of like the muscle so you get hypertrophy of the right ventricle um, and with your oscies you can say that it's best heard at the fifth intercostal space midclavicular line right mitral regurgitation i'll go through that quickly um, there are multiple causes of mitral regurgitation um, including idiopathic weakening of the valve with age ischemic heart disease infective endocarditis, rheumatic heart disease and connective tissue disorders. So if you don't know the cause, you can probably guess and get it right. <laughs> That's quite a lot. Um, so in terms of this murmur, you get a pan-systolic high-pitched whistling murmur um, and that radiates to the left axilla, results in congestive cardiac failure and associated with the third heart valve. With um, valvular heart disease, if you type it into Google in terms of the murmurs and hear them and then relate that to which valve um, disease causes that murmur, then it will help you in sort of uh, what, uh, actually knowing what you would hear because it's easy to know, oh yeah, it's a mid-diastolic low pitch rumbling murmur, but if you actually hear it, then it will help you. Um, um, as, as, a, as a doctor in the future because there's no point in just knowing what the answer is and not actually know what it means. Okay, next question. A 61 year old woman visits her GP to review her medication for her angina. She's concerned about her condition and is asking what's caused her narrowing of her coronary arteries. So what's happened in the process of atherosclerosis? Is it phagocytosis of HDLs by macrophages, foaming foam cells, infiltration of the tunica externa by the LDL particles, fatty infiltration of the subendothelial space, or hypertrophy of the arterial layers? Which one do you guys think is the right answer? Okay, someone said C. Does anyone else have an answer? Someone said A. Another person said A. Okay, so the right answer is C. The reason it's not A is because it's actually phagocytosis of the LDLs by macrophages rather than HDLs. It's not B because it's not the tunic externa that there's infiltration, there's, it's the subendothelial space. Um, okay, let's go through atherosclerosis. So with atherosclerosis, it's important to know the stages um, and you know, little things like phagocytosis of the HDLs, LDLs, they can really catch you out because you think it's the right answer, but just that little um, one word can make it it can mean that you're wrong. So with atherosclerosis, it's development of an atheroma in the artery wall. And to know what that means, you need to know what an atheroma actually is. And that is a lipid filled plaque that can enlarge and eventually impinge on the vessel lumen. So with atherosclerosis, it's good to think about, first of all, the risk factors and you can link that into what it's characterized in. So the top three, smoking, hypertension, and diabetes, they all lead to endothelial dysfunction. So they just destroy the endothelium. And with dyslipidemia, you get the high LDLs and low HDLs. 
that leads to an accumulation of LDLs because HDLs is what um, would transport the LDLs back into um, the liver to be broken down. So you've got loads of LDLs and you've got an absolutely destroyed endothelium that will lead to ather atherosclerosis by this process. So the LDLs, they diffuse across the damaged endothelium and they accumulate in the intima layer of the artery wall. Why is this bad? Because they soon get oxidized into lipids and this triggers inflammation in the vessel wall. And what comes with inflammation? You get loads of monocytes and they differentiate into macrophages. The macrophages then phagocytose all these oxidized LDLs that I was going on about. And they become filled with fat and that's when it's called foam cells. Initially you get fatty streaks in the early stages of atherosclerosis but then over time you get these foam cells that accumulate in the intima. They form a lipid core and then you can get fibrous connective tissue that sort of encapsulates this um, core and forms a fibrous cap and then you develop an atheroma. That can eventually either rupture or not rupture and causes loads of complications as I've outlined in this table. So you have stable angina, acute coronary syndrome, transient ischemic attack, cerebrovascular accident, aortic aneurysms, peripheral vascular disease and bowel infarction. And because atherosclerosis, it affects the arteries and you have arteries everywhere in the body, so it affects everywhere in your body, not just one place. Um, in this talk, we're going to be talking about uh, acute coronary syndrome. So I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that now. Okay, that kind of gives you a clue as to what this kind of question is about. Um, so... A 70 year old man turns up to a &E with acute chest pain. You notice he's clutching his chest and he looks really sweaty. Right. Okay. No, I won't go on to that. What, how would you, what's your approach to this patient? If you were an a &E doctor, what would, how would you investigate this patient? What would you do? What would you ask him? How would you start, for example? Okay, ECG, troponin, at rest or exercise, yes. So essentially what I'm getting at is you would start with a comprehensive history, provided that he's stable and not like about to die. Um, so you start with a history and because he's in pain, that, that would prompt you to think of what mnemonic in terms of the history. Does anyone know of that helpful mnemonic yeah, Socrates. So, Emma, can you tell me what what Socrates actually stands for? What what, what it means, or oh, anyone else actually? The whole thing. It's you can just type in the chat or um, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, sight onset character radiation. I forgot what A is. Uh, time yeah, alleviating symptoms and severity. Yeah, that's really good. And with A, it's associated symptoms. So that would be any sweating or any shortness of breath, um, particularly related to his chest pain. But that was really good. Well done. Um, so here I put Socrates here and he has pain in his chest in the right in the centre. It started half an hour ago and it's a sharp pain. He needs to catch his breath. Radiation, sometimes to his jaw. Um, and he's experiencing a lot of nausea and vomiting, sweating, shortness of breath. Nothing's helped to relieve it. He's not had the chance to try any painkillers given that it only started half an hour ago. And what made it start was the brisk walk with his dog. And he says it's about a nine out of 10 um, pain scale. With other parts of the history, you would obviously ask for past medical history, family history, drug history, allergies, social history, review of symptoms, so from top to toe, and ICE. Does anyone know what ICE stands for? So 
So it's ideas, concerns and expectations of the patient. So what they think might have caused it, what their biggest concerns are and what they expect to get out of the chat they're having with you. Um, so if you look closely at this person's, this patient's history, what do you think might be going on with this, with this man? What are you thinking so far? Okay, say you, you don't really know what's going on, you want to investigate a little bit more. What would you do next? After history, what comes after history? Someone said state of angina yet. What? ECG, not quite there yet. Start off with sort of simpler things. After history, you would do a physical examination. So you'd, you'd examine this guy. You'd also do some bedside tests as well check out his vital signs and then you would go on to a bit of the complex ones like an ECG that you said quite rightly. Yeah blood pressure as well that's important. Um, so on, on, a, on examination sorry he's clutching his chest as we said he's sweaty nauseated tachycardic but normal capillary refill time. Does anyone know how you would measure the capillary refill time and when you'd be concerned? Yeah, so you press on the finger, I don't know if you can see, you press on the finger bed here for five seconds and then you release it and if the blood goes gushing back, if it goes back to its pinkish colour within two seconds, then that's fine. It's a bit longer than you'd start to worry. Um, it's more than two seconds of a concern. If you just try that and you're on your own finger now see what how long it takes um so in terms of your, your differentials it's always good to have three top differentials and to know a little bit about um each of them but the main one i'm going to be talking about is an acute coronary syndrome so investigations someone someone's already said which ones to do someone said blood pressure and ecg that's right as well you do your bedside ones like check the heart rate out, the blood pressure, the respirate, um, what they are uh, saturating on room air if they're attached to um, an oxygen machine or and check out their temperature too. 12 lead ECG is really important with acute coronary syndrome. You want to check out what, what the leads are saying in terms of an ST elevation or um, depression, see what the T waves are saying. With a blood test, why would you check out for why would you want to do a full blood count it's to check for any underlying anemia what about troponin t and, t and i which are really important in this case does anyone know what they are this is kind of important for your um end block test by the way i don't know what troponin t and i are how are you yeah, the pro yeah, the protein what someone said? Yeah, markers for ischemia, yeah, that's good. And then you do a chest x-ray too. How would you initially manage this patient? If you were the doctor in charge, what would you do? Okay, so you do an ABCDE assessment go through their airway, breathing, circulation, their GC, GCS score and everything else. Then initially you'd go for morphine and metoclopramide, um, supplementary oxygen if they need it, nitrates if there's ongoing chest pain that can be given either sublingually or intravenously and then aspirin 300 milligram stat dose plus either clopidogrel or triquelidol. You can learn this through the, the, the MONA. I put here morphine, oxygen, nitrates, and aspirin and clopidogrel. If you have a system like that in mind when you're thinking about answering these questions, you will definitely get it right. You won't miss anything out. Yeah, someone said that in the chat. That's really good. So I want to touch on troponin T and I, given that um, they might be tested 
on in your exams. Um, does anyone know, does, can anyone tell me about troponin TNI? Someone said they're markers of ischemia. Um, can anyone tell me why they're important? So if you've got a damaged cardiac, um, if, if you've got a damaged muscle, all the cardiac myocytes are going to release into the blood. And about two or four hours after the myocardial infarction, you get troponin. And this is why you get a raised troponin T and I in the blood. It's the most specific marker of um, myocardial necrosis. And because it's, it clears from the circulation relatively slowly, um, these levels will but normalize within two weeks, whereas you've got another marker, which is creatinine kinase, and that normalizes within three days, which is important to know. Okay, someone's anything? Yeah, that, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, I'll go on quickly because I don't think we have that much time left. So acute coronary syndrome, it's life-threatening. Um, you, in order to diagnose this, you need, um, just quickly go through this, actually, no, I'll go to that later. Um, the risk factors, the modifiable, non-modifiable, really quickly, can anyone tell me what the modifiable risk factors are of acute coronary syndrome? Yeah, diet, but what kind of diet though? Like you could have a really good diet, but you might not be predisposed to acute coronary syndrome. High fat diet, yeah, so anything with loads of cholesterol in. Smoking, yeah. So you've got things like hypertension, diabetes, non-modifiable, being male, and having family history of someone having an MI um, younger than 55. Alcohol, yeah. So if we go back to that case that was, you know, the, the man, he's got almost all of them. So he's a smoker, he drinks, um, he's got high blood pressure, so hypertension, his dad had an MI, um, and he's got diabetes too, which is also a risk factor. Um, signs and symptoms, so exactly how the patient presented. Acute central chest pain lasts longer than 20 minutes, radiates to the left jaw or arm, doesn't necessarily have to, but it can do. You get nausea and sweating and dyspnea and palpitations, pallor. And you know the associated symptoms part of the Socrates um, acronym, then you think of sweating, nausea and shortness of breath. That's what you'd ask for. Um, a bit about sort of the investigations we've already talked about. Um, diagnosis, you need to have two of the three. So you need to have unstable ischemic chest pain, ischemic ECG changes, and a raised cardiac biomarker, which is the troponin T and I. So if you've got two out of the three, then you've got acute coronary syndrome. ECG changes, you look for um, ST elevation or ST uh, depression in the region, um, in the area of ischemia even. Bloods, the troponins that I've been lying on about, and you can get these findings on chest x-ray too. I won't go into them, I haven't got much time left. Um, treatment depends on if it's an, an NSTEMI or a STEMI. If it's a STEMI, you, get, you have an urgent discussion with a local cardiac centre. You've got a quite a narrow time period in which you have to do that. Um, and if it's an NSTEMI, then it's some sort of medical management with elective surgery. A bit about prognosis as well. You can go on, you, I think I can give you these slides at the end or it'll be on YouTube, or whatever, so you can have a read back through these. Um, secondary prevention, so this is different from sort of your initial management. You give aspirin, but uh, um, the dose is smaller. Um, the, the antiplatelets that we talked about and torvastatin, ACE inhibitors that we also talked about before, beta blocker and aldosterone antagonist for those with clinical heart failure. And in order to sort of control the modifiable risk factors that we talked about before, 
yeah, smoking cessation is really important, reducing alcohol consumption, a Mediterranean diet, if you don't know, that's a low fat diet. Um, cardiac rehabilitation, optimised treatment for the things that they have like diabetes and hypertension, make sure they're actually taking their medication. Um, so some quick questions to sort of round this session off. What's the most common cause of aortic stenosis? Idiopathic age related calcification. Next one. The consultant again asks you to feel for the patient's carotid pulse. When you feel it, it feels as though the blood shot up under high blood pressure, under high pressure, even then immediately disappears. What do you think is going on? What valvular pathology does that indicate? I'll give you about a half a minute for this one, maybe 20 seconds actually. So aortic regurgitation. I've put a little, um, a few notes on the on side there. Um, so if you get a rapidly increasing than collapsing pulse, think of aortic regurgitation. And a bit of an explanation there. I'm reading you in time. Right. So 64 year old man. He's got shortness of breath. It's worse on exertion. And when lying flat at night, he's got ischemic heart disease. He's on medication for angina and he's had two previous endostomies before in the past. When you listen to his chest, he has pan-systolic murmur louder at the apex. What's the most likely cause of his murmur? Pan-systolic murmur, what do you think? Got some questions, yeah. Mitral regurgitation, yes. So, oh. Oh gosh, pan-systolic murmur, mitral regurgitation, aortic stenosis, crescendo, decrescendo. You know, you get these murmurs coming off the, the, the tip of your tongue. When you see, for example, aortic stenosis, think crescendo, decrescendo murmur, and you will score all the points in the, in the symptom exam that comes up. So a few of the resources I've used today I used mainly zero to finals, but some advice for you second years. I'll just go through everything they give to you in terms of um, the lectures. So look at the learning objectives really, really closely and learn what's on the lecture slides, whether that be through flashcards, whether that be through friends testing you or your mom testing you or doing little podcasts, because whatever they give to you, they will ask you about. And sometimes they give hints as well in the lectures. I remember being in a lecture and uh, the lecturer just kind of looked at us like, this might come up. So I made sure to write it in red in my notes um, so that when I went back to revising, I really revised whatever they said. Um, YouTube channels, so I included some there. Ninja Nurse is really good, although it is like an hour long per topic, but it goes through things really, really well. And um, there are there are loads of new YouTube channels coming up with some like quick um, pathophysiology videos. Also, Auckland's Anatomy is good for anatomy, and I think I use Anatomy TV as well, which is free. If you go on the library website for medicine, there's a link there, and Anatomy TV is really good. Um, BMJ Best Practice. That I use that to make my flashcards and as I said zero to finals it's it's all right as a point of reference it's a bit um it's very comprehensive but if you want to know look, the nitty-gritty of things read around the topic so that if there are any unexpected exam questions that come up you can sort of give it your best shot as opposed to knowing sort of the minimum if you understand where I'm coming from. I hope you found this session helpful and useful ahead of your test on Friday. Best